Today, though, we are delighted to welcome Hannah Pullin Galai, uh, who is a senior lecturer of Yiddish and Holocaust studies in the Department of Literature at Tel Aviv University, and the author of a book that is right here, uh, Ecologies, <laughs> Ecologies of Witnessing Language, Place, and Holocaust Testimony, which came out on Yale University, in Yale University Press in 2018. And we have some information about the book uh, outside, so grab a flyer on your way out. Um, and Hanna is a remarkable polyglot scholar with a broad intellectual range um, writing articles on everything from Avram Sutskever's poetry to Soviet songs and even contemporary Israeli politics, for instance, for the nation uh, and other venues. And she's a, uh, as a representative of an organization uh, called Standing Together. So she's a scholar who does not just engage with her field of study solely for the purpose of scholarly production, but I think she clearly draws from her work to inform her fight for social justice causes today. Um, she'll be speaking about her book, and once she has talked for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and afterwards, uh, her presentation will be followed by a response from Deborah Dwork, who was the founding director of the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and is the Rose Professor of History at Clark University. She's written numerous articles, chapters, and many books. I'm just going to name a few. Uh, most recently, 2011, on Northwestern University Press was A Boy in Terezin, The Private Diary of Pavel Weiner, Introductions and Annotations. She's co-authored a number of books with Robert Van Pelt, uh, Flight from the Reich, 1933 to 1946, that came out in 2009, and Auschwitz, uh, 12, 1270 to the present. Uh, in the German edition of that book, I would note, um, was voted the number one title in the German National Book Critics List uh, in November 1998. And um, uh, by Newsweek, it was voted as one of the 10 best books about Poland during World War II in August 2019, 20, 2009. Uh, there was an Emmy Award nominee documentary based on this work called Auschwitz, The Blueprints of Genocide, produced by the BBC. And it aired in, in, in the UK and in the US. Uh, and it also served as a, as a central source for a seven-part documentary series, also produced by the BBC, called Auschwitz, Inside the Nazi State. Um, the books received National Jewish Book Awards and many other awards. But nonetheless, we're very happy to have you here, Deborah. And with that, let's welcome Hannah to the podium to give her presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Stephen, for that generous introduction. It's really quite moving to talk about this book here at the Fortunoff Archive, since I did um, part of my research here, and it was generously assisted by Joanne Rudolph, who's here, and uh, she stayed in touch with me for years afterwards to, to really help me um, see whatever I wanted to see about the archive. And I think that as I and I, I did write this in the, in the, in the acknowledgments that that's, that's not a technicality. Um, helping researchers in the humanities in that way is a, is a statement. It's a statement of values um, to be both uh, someone who aggregates and organizes testimony as well as someone who facilitates open research and new questions on it. So I really thank you for that and thank you for having me here. I want to start by, I'm not going to talk about the Israeli side of the book because of the time limit, but if you want to ask me about that later, um, I brought the book so I can look things up. <laughs> so I want to start with that historic date that Stephen just mentioned, May 2nd, May 2nd, 1979, and I do believe that that's an historic date. Um, and that the recording of Holocaust testimony in the last two decades of the 20th century should be considered a historical event in its own right. An event of commemoration of archival creation, a public declaration of values, and also critically, an event of translation. Scholars have rightly asserted that the scale and technological practices of recent Holocaust testimony projects 
have changed the scope and circulation of witness narrative. But what remains unaddressed is how these same testimony-taking projects also attempted a radical act of translation, a transference of knowledge and ideas across lingual and geographic borders. For example, the USC Shaw Foundation Institute alone has recorded testimony in 52 different countries and in 36 different languages, bringing with it potentially specific American-rooted concepts of history, selfhood, and suffering. My research investigates what happened and what happens to the testimonial enterprise and the conceptual web on which it rests when it arrives in different geographic and lingu linguistic contexts, or as I term them, ecologies of witnessing. Viewed comparatively, victim testimony footage reveals profound distinctions in how people from different settings tell the truth about the violence that they endured in the Holocaust. So I approach this question of translation through a specific case study. Um, I look into ho Holocaust testimonies, of video and audio Holocaust testimonies of Lithuanian Jews who were all born uh, before 1935 and they survived the Holocaust in one way or another. Um, so they have that much in common. And then after the Holocaust, they either stayed in Lithuania, moved to Israel, or moved to the US. And they chose to give their testimony in this later period um, from 1979 on in one of three languages, in Yiddish, English, or in Hebrew. So um, why did I choose Lithuania for this? Uh, case study. I hope that this map will just give us a, a reminder of how uh, Lithuania was originally annexed to the Soviet Union in 1940 and then reincorporated into the USSR after World War II. So the reincorporation meant that apart from those Lithuanian Jews who happened to have pre-war Polish citizenship, Holocaust survivors who returned to Lithuania after the war were required to stay there at least until the 1970s. So that meant that there was actually a, a somewhat robust community of, of Holocaust survivors in Lithuania after the war. Um, the, the community hovered around 30,000 members. Um, and Yiddish was actually quite prominent in the, their communal interactions for different reasons. So um, that ecology um, interested me greatly. And at the same time, of course, m most of uh, the Lithuanian Jewish survivors moved, s somehow m managed to move to either um, the US or North America or Israel after the war. And they were very instrumental in those places in leading the way in, in different commemoration efforts. So for those reasons, I thought that Lithuanian Jewry would make an especially interesting case study. For roughly a decade, I dwelt with over 100 testimonies of Lithuanian Jews from these three settings, both as an interviewer and as a listener. Over the course of that process, I became convinced that the witness's language, place, environment deeply informs her mode of truth-telling. The witness's ecological resources, the words, images, and social norms at her disposal shaped critical concepts like justice, guilt, strength, pain, and even love and family in the Holocaust. It is to this last point of difference, ideas about family and belonging in Holocaust narratives, on which I will focus my lecture today. A lot of the most prominent Holocaust narratives in American culture are actually family stories. Um, the Diary of Anne Frank, one of the reasons why it's uh, why it's considered appropriate for seventh graders is that it tells a family story and the family story accompanies the Holocaust story. Uh, likewise, Art Spiegelman's Mouse um, narrates the Holocaust through the lens of an intimate father-son relationship. And at the entrance to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, there is a small pre-exhibit of sorts called Daniel's Story 
which physicalizes that family focus that we see in, in other literary texts. And I think that um, the family framework here, the, the nuclear family as it's depicted through a small household and the intimate spaces of a bedroom, a bathroom, a kitchen, is deemed appropriate as an entrance space, an architectural choice, because family is thought to be a universal and inviting topic and much easier, supposedly, than politics or, um, or, or culture or resistance. And um, I would like to differ with that from that position. I think that, that family um, is not universal and not in Holocaust testimonies and that the differences between family stories across lingual and, and geographic boundaries are quite significant um, to, to how they see the Holocaust as a whole and to how witnesses see the act of testimony. So in this lecture, I'm going to examine just one rich testimony from two of the ecologies in question, an English speaker from North America and a Yiddish speaker from Lithuania. This isn't quantitative sociology, so the examples that I, the way that I work with examples is not by finding a median or a mean example and claiming that they're representative of everyone else like them, but rather I look for examples um, from the group that I studied who pick up on important pressure points in rich ways, okay? So the first testimony that I'll discuss, it's a, it's a Fortunoff testimony from a woman named Suzanne H. From the start of Suzanne's testimony, her parents are not only themes of narration, they are the filter through which she retrieves history, helping her to discern the relevance of information and images that surface from pre-war life. For example, Suzanne recalls the physical space of her childhood as a reflection of her parents' personalities. Their home in the suburbs of Vilna was, and I quote, a very pretty building with a garden in front. Every spring, my father used to plant flowers in front. I used to look forward to it, taking us on a tour through her house and in a way through her parental child relationships. She then relates, I remember my mother having very cheerful accessories. Like her immediate physical surroundings, the larger political atmosphere in Vilna also appears in relation to her parents' personalities. Suzanne tells that even though they were highly secular Jews, her father chose to send her to a Jewish school as a child rather than a Polish one because, quote, he was angry at the way that the Polish people looked at the Jews. So in this formulation, anti-Semitism becomes a reality of past experience something to which she is a credible eyewitness when it impacts her father emotionally. Bringing this social perspective into the war years, Suzanne recounts events of the Holocaust through the prism of personal perception and interaction with her parents and brother. Early after the German invasion of Vilna on June 24, 1941, Suzanne recalls a conversation with her mother during one of the early roundups that year. I kept her I kept on telling mother, oh, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, even though I was petrified. This intimate dialogue is what makes the event real. Sparing in details about the scene around her, Suzanne is very precise about her and her mother's emotional exchange. Suzanne and her family survived these initial roundups and were forced to move into the Vilna ghetto at the beginning of September. After a short while, they were able to move into the Kailis fur factory on the outskirts of the city, which was a small, one of two small work camps um, just outside of Vilna, Kailis, and Hakepe, each of which um, was a small brick enclosure with roughly a thousand Jews working and imprisoned there. Suzanne explains that, though her, that since her family did not have an official license to be in Kailis, they were eventually forced to move back into the ghetto. She briefly summarizes the cultural milieu of the ghetto that she found when she returned there. They had a theater, they had some culture, they even opened a restaurant, and that's it. Events unfold independently from this cultural milieu, 
The main stage of causality is within the intimate emotional space of her family. We can also, I can, we can almost think of Suzanne's relationship in her memory narrative to her cultural milieu um, in the way that Eric Auerbach describes the uh, protagonists in Stendhal's work. He says, a man seems to be thrown by chance into, his milieu, into the milieu in which he lives. Suzanne's focus on her nuclear family relationship becomes even more striking as the narrative progresses. The family sneaks back into the Kylie's work camp when the Vilna ghetto is about to be liquidated. There, her parents are caught outside of the camp, and it's, it's a bit complicated. I won't go into it. The guards agree to release her father, but not her mother. And Suzanne envisions a conversation between the two of them, her mother saying, you have to stay and find the children, you have to raise the children. He gave her all the jewelry he had. That was it. Later, I heard that they made them take their clothes off at Punar and shot them. The loss of Suzanne's mother, the quick depiction of her being stripped and shot at Punar, constitutes the turning point in her view of history, the moment when life changed from difficult to abnormal. Evidence of this catastrophic rift comes from within Suzanne's body. She says, I was 12 years old and I used to wet my bed. I later learned that you want your mother back and this is what we did. I was so embarrassed at the time and my aunt used to, tell, to yell at me and I didn't know what to do. So she's focused on the pre-conscious physiological reaction to loss and in doing so, she frames this moment as a break in the natural order of mind-body health. Um, some people, like one of my very own dissertation advisors, uh, David Roskies, have looked at testimonies like this in the Fortunoff archive and criticized the interviewers or the institutional culture for supposedly distancing the survivor's story what, from what they consider history. Um, and I disagree with that normative position. It's not, um, it's not out of ignorance or short-sightedness that witnesses like Suzanne downplay a distinction, a depiction of the larger milieu from which they came. In Dominique Lecapre's formulation, the story of a greater Jewish collective is absent rather than lost in testimonies like this. In Suzanne's framework, and in the book, I do argue that there are um, a great number of other survivors in this ecology who share this perspective in one way or another. The Holocaust appears most damaging when it unhinges the emotional economy of each household. So if catastrophe occurs in the psychic and sensational realm of each family, then that is where history happens that one had better examine the singular family stories one at a time moving household to household in order to assess the damage of history. It is simply not especially relevant to reconstruct social externalities of Jewish belonging when internalities appear as such powerful tools for telling and explaining the truth about the past. And in this sense also I distance myself from some of the I guess you could call them more simplistic or aggressive critiques of, of psychoanalysis that are out. We discussed some of them yesterday at the, uh, the event for Carolyn Dean's book, where um, in denaturalizing uh, personal experience as a mode of remembering history, and I do think it's, it's worth denaturalizing and not considering it universal, people then delegitimize it. And um, that's just as as culturally intrusive and dismissive as doing the opposite, which is um, universalizing it and claiming that everyone should testify that way. So, so far, I imagine that um, this is relatively intuitive um, for you. I will just point out before I move on to the next session that there are witnesses who comment on and even dispute the kind of psychotherapeutic nuclear family focus that I pointed out in Suzanne's story. As just one example, a Shoah Foundation witness named Meir Shapiro argues with his interviewers' questions about his parents. So his interviewers asking him for the kind of story that Suzanne tells. 
what did your parents do? What kind of games did you play together? How did you feel? And, and uh, Mayor Shapiro answers, look, it's just not the way it is now. Parents spending a lot of time with their children. That's not, that was not the case then with me or with anyone. Parents keep kept to themselves and children grew up with whatever they could get for themselves. So that is to say, not all witnesses in this English American ecology endorse a nuclear, pam a nuclear family paradigm but most respond to it in some fashion, even if it's as a direct counterpoint when piecing together their stories. So this is probably the, the, the kind of um, rhetorical conditions, to use Carolyn's phrase, that you're most familiar with. And now I want to talk about um, the one that I brought in to this book that hadn't been researched at all, the one that I, in fact, started with. I conducted interviews in Yiddish and Lithuania. And I want to focus on the uh, testimony of Doba Rosenberg, who was interviewed by the Shoah Foundation Institute in Kovna, Lithuania, Kaunas, in 1996. She was born in 1928. Whereas testimonies from this English-speaking American corpus are rich with resources for discussing emotional exchanges between parents and children, Yiddish Lithuanian testimonies display abundance of a different sort. They speak a great deal about a broad family community matrix, alongside many different categories of blood relations, mishpuche, familie, kreivim, freind, all of which are synonyms for family. Witnesses devote much attention to people with a much hazier kind of closeness, friends, acquaintances, townspeople, or those they simply call unzere, ours. As shorthand for this whole semantic cluster, I use the term the agene, the agene, one's own. This adjective, crucially, can be used alone, functioning as a noun, or be paired with a whole variety of reference. That means that one's own what, agene vos, is tellingly left open. It can refer to family, friends, townspeople, schoolmates, coworkers, and others with some significant shared experience. Doba Rosenberg, born in Jorbrich in 1928, interviewed by the Shoah Foundation. She introduces herself on camera by declaring, Ich allein bin a Jorbricher. I myself am a Jorbricher, in the present tense. So even in uh, 1996, she discusses herself, she presents herself as a part of this local matrix in a place that for her doesn't really exist anymore in the present tense. This is still the best way to say who she is on camera. Um, Doba narrates the first days of war as they affected the Jurbericher collectively. She reports on the fate of a broad cast of characters, such as my mother's brother, Uncle Fievel, my father's brother, Uncle Max. Doba spreads her narrative focus among many Jurbericher, but does take special care when speaking about her parents. She's brought to tears when she recounts her father shouting, watch out for yourselves, look out for one another, as he was caught and led away from their house in an early roundup of the town's Jewish men. However, following her father's capture, surprisingly, Doba's narrative quickly progresses. She tells us that she and her mother found shelter in the house of someone she describes as, quote, the neighbor my mother's cousin's husband, Abivais. So rather than delving into her emotional reaction to the loss of her father, she shifts her social emphasis onto this other relationship. She performs a similar shift immediately after recalling the capture of her mother. Doba was knocked unconscious when her when um, local Lithuanian uh, collaborators took away her mother. And she says, when I woke up, I was already at the Vaises with Henye Bahenyin at her house, my mother's cousin with her kids. Of course, I screamed and cried, and they all comforted me. And what's especially different if we're comparing uh, the testimony of Suzanne H. to Doba Rosenberg, you recall that Suzanne H., she really felt um, almost nothing towards her surrogate parents. They were unnatural. They yelled at her. She, she wet her bed when she was brought into a new household. And Doba, 
uh, actually treats this kind of shift as natural, and she claims that it was in keeping with the way that she was brought up before the war. She says, of course, this Mira Melne, Henya's daughter, and my mother were always like sisters. We'd always been like one family. Her acceptance and justification of this new family arrangement stands in contrast to a wide uh, variety of reactions that I found among American witnesses who address surrogate parents with disappointment or humorous discomfort. So um, Doba has essentially become a part of this new family in, in Jürbrich, and uh, they, they take parent-like responsibility for her and using a whole wide variety of connections, all of which she, she explicates on, on camera. Actually, in, um, in the Shoah Foundation archives, they have a short informational questionnaire which the interviewer is supposed to fill out, and um, there's a white blank space about this big on one of the pages asking for the people named in the, in the interview. And most of the time that suffices, that's the, apparently since that's the space that they were allotted. And in, in Doba's case, the interviewer actually had to add on two pages in order to list all the names that Doba includes. And I think that the naming, the inclusion of, of um, so many characters is significant. That is, it expresses an expectation that the listener is going to be able to follow along. This is relevant information. I can follow Doba's mother's cousin's brother and Fievel's da 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 da. So first of all, it says something about who her expected audience of memory is. She's accustomed to telling her story to people who know this matrix. And it says something about her sense of self, that it's spread among this whole chorus of people. Um, that this is, this, is not, um, this is not a diversion for her to go into this long chain of names. This is actually part of who she is. So through this long um, chain of people, this cluster arrives in the Kovna ghetto. And upon their arrival, Doba encounters a new version of her Agene collective. And I'll play you a bit of her testimony at this point. And pay, att pay attention, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in the middle and tell you what I want you to pay attention to. I just tested this. I tested it too, it works. <laughs> there. For, pause for a second and point out something interesting about the kind of socialities that don't interest Doba. So the interviewer asked her what happened to her, her belongings. And she says, I, I, you know, I don't know, there was some, some station there with people. So she's not interested in whether her belongings went to the Judenrat or to some community organization or who took it away. So um, this is in distinction to Israeli testimonies. I'm not going to discuss it. She's not really interested in formal associations of people, formalized groups that have names on them, you know, like political organizations. There's not one mention. She's not interested in youth groups. She's interested specifically in this agene, this informal and flexible type of, of, um, of group of bonding. And I'll just play a little bit more for you and do note the number of names that come up and also the details that she shares about these people, their addresses and so forth, okay? Okay. 
e a chuva avança no tempo e a sua vida. Neste mesmo que foi, nada me acontece. É tão simples, eu acho que é. Então não me vai. Pode ver que a Cacilha é uma coisa que a gente não sabe. Não, deixa eu ver que vai dar. Não, bem, não dá a vida. A minha data, nem o dia, está aqui no fogo. Só para a vida de cura, a energia de nem o fogo, não está aqui no fogo. Então, tem a vida de mim, claro, vai ler, mas eu não sei se nós não estamos aqui no fogo. O desenvolvimento do meu filho Chico, que eu quero matar e que eu quero fazer isso da graça de mim. So, note how her memory of her bodily life is also in concert with her notion of belonging. Um, she doesn't survive by distinguishing herself or running away from people or being strong. She actually depicts survival as a kind of um, cuddling type of activity. And she, she says, she details that she slept on the floor with her grandmother and she goes on and says, who shared a bed with whom? So in a sense, um, also, surviving is, is about um, melding in with people in this kind of, through these kinds of small motions. Um, her intonation, even while she's telling, I realize that, that it's, it's, it's hard to watch too much of it when you're, not, um, when you're not that familiar with it, precisely because there aren't really these big climatic moments in her testimony, and there aren't really what we consider cathartic moments. It's really a kind, there's a kind of um, continuous pulse to it, and that too, in a way, echoes and amplifies her way of presenting belonging as, as, as Egan as something with these um, movements and replacements and adjustments rather than a really sharp overturning and flipping around of the world like we saw with Suzanne H. This does not mean that Doba's testimony is more upbeat or that this is a resilience narrative as in, uh, in uh, opposition to a trauma narrative. Um, Doba, because Doba keeps repopulating the Egene as the testimony goes on, she actually has to lose more people too. And this is palpable, this is in, in the testimony. For instance, while she was in, in the, still in the Kovna ghetto, she bonds with young cousin's cousin, cousin, um, Avivale. And when Avivale was taken away, she says, I didn't want to go because this Avivale was to me like a, how do you say it? I loved her very much and she loved me. This moment is actually one of the few in the testimony when Doba speaks explicitly of love, Hobenholtz, throughout the whole testimony. So in her emotional repertoire, um, these are not instrumental relationships. This is love, um, this egg and belonging practice. It's really a practice. It's not a set group of people. So even with these pronounced breaks in her circle of belonging, the overall framework of egg adjusts and continues to organize her social interactions. One way in which Doba performs this conceptual adjustment, this stretching of the Egenin network is by loosening her geographic criteria of identification. While she was in Kovna, Doba considered herself a Yurbriker. But once she was taken away to an Estonian work camp, Irda, Doba begins to speak of herself as a Kovna. And everyone who is in Kovna is now part of her circle. Then when she's taken away to Stutthof about a year later, also, the prisoners from Erida are included into her circle. And um, there in Kovna, I mean, excuse me, in Stutthof, she bonds together with this particular group of women, uh, Froy Shapiro, Mrs. Shapiro, Mrs. Karnishivsky, and Malka Gempel. And these become co-protagonists of her story, and she actually tells in great, great detail what happens to each one of them. Um, sharing the narrative stage with these other individuals. The Egene is not just a system of inclusion, it's also a system of exclusion. Doba specifies, for example, that prisoners who arrived at Stutthof from Romania were also Jewish, but she, she qualifies quickly, they stayed separately, they weren't Egene. And she feels this also on her return. She returns to Lithuania, she depicts the country as a desolate place, a place of ruin, 
um, in which Jewish survivors regroup according to some new application of old ideas. She recounts her arrival at this train station. We arrived in Vilna. The Vilna came and started to ask if maybe some of their Egne were there. They gave us a place to sleep. We stayed there a few days and then we moved on. So Doba seems to understand, share a kind of um, normative language with these Vilna to understand that they're looking for their Egne and she's not one of them. She moves on, um, progressively going back to her original site of origin and um, goes back to Jurberik and there she finds none other than Abba Vilis, the mother's cousin's husband who took her in at the very beginning of the war. And the way that she describes this encounter is truly as a type of homecoming. Um, she says, Abba spotted me like his Egenkind, like his own child. He took me in right away. And he kept me like his Egen child, like his own child. So Abba and Doba reconstitute a household, um, and she lives there up until her wedding in 1946. Doba hastens to mention that the man she chooses to marry is, quote, also a Jurberiker. Again, a title that remains relevant in the present tense in 1996 when she's talking. And she also identifies the families that her children married into by citing microgeographic origin. She tells, for example, my daughter-in-law is from Zarasai, which is an Eastern Lithuanian town. Thus, in her post-war and current state of being, Doba depicts herself embedded in the kind of group in which she began her story. It is not that Doba's family story is one of resilience, again, and the testimonies from the English-American corpus focused on loss. Doba also depicts post-war life as incomplete. Most members of her original group have been destroyed, but the criteria that enable people to connect survive the Holocaust. So um, why is this? It's a surprising way of narrating the Holocaust to, 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 cl to claim uh, even implicitly this type of continuity. Um, I think that in this group of testimonies studied here, witnesses formed their narrative habits in both the language and physical environments of pre-war life. And I do believe that physical landscape is very important in shaping memory. It's not only about words and what people read in the newspaper and hear their friends say, it's also the sights that they see out their window. And I think that this doubling of lingual and, and physical um, continuity encourages a type of semantic continuity in their memory and to amplify and, and focus on these types of conceptual through lines from the pre-war to the post-war period. So, and again, I, I, I want to point out that there are witnesses from the same environment who ridicule the Egene as a platform of memory. I interviewed one woman in Kovna named uh, Rive S. And she, I, I learned to talk about the Egene. I, I, I conducted 47 interviews in, in Yiddish in Lithuania, and they taught me to talk like Doba, you know, everybody adjusts. So I was asking, what well, was your cousin's name, so forth, and she had no patience for that whatsoever. She wanted to discuss, and I quote, public life, you know, different Jewish organizations on the street. And by that, she meant the communist underground. She told me nothing about cousins. She openly disliked the children from her Kovna neighborhood who joined the Zionist parties. That is to say, the subtly flexion, flexible notion of kinship that I've been calling the Egene is not a requirement of testimony in this Yiddish-speaking Lithuanian cluster, but one that witnesses have to address in some manner, even if in disdain. So um, I, I am going to conclude my talk here in two different ways. It's going to sound kind of like a Doors song that has you know, this ending and then it has that ending. Um, one, of the, one of my conclusions is, is a major claim of my book, so I really wanted to get it out there and, and, and have you hear it. And then another um, of my conclusions relates to the contribution that Yale scholars um, made, uh, specifically one Yale scholar made in, in uh, informing my research. So, what does it matter what I pointed out here? You know, okay, so, so one testimony is about continuity and one, you know, has a specific point of break. 
And I think that it's more than just, uh, it's more, it, it's, it says something about the event itself and it relates, this different distinction relates to an ongoing question that's been kicked around in Holocaust studies for quite a while. And that is, is the Holoc was the Holocaust a catastrophe in the strict sense of the word? As you all know, since you're smart and you're at Yale. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I don't need to tell you, the catastrophe doesn't just mean a mass amount of human carnage and suffering. Catastrophe means, and this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, an event that produces a subversion of the order of things. A catastrophe is a dark cultural revolution in a sense. And um, that claim I think you know, people go back and forth about it on an empirical level if, as if they can prove you know, some certain amount of cultural change that would determine, which would answer this question sufficiently. And I actually think that this question is open and that um, the, the post-war setting of memory completes the meaning of the event and gives shape to whether or not this is a catastrophe or not. So in Susan's testimony and others like hers, there is a distinct moment, as you recall, it comes from her body, in which things broke and they had to be rebuilt in a new way. So it's catastrophe on the most intimate, bodily, personal uh, level for her and then it expands out into her worldview. She changed her language, she changed her place of, of, of belonging, she changed the way that she's Jewish. And I don't think that catastrophe is um, an accurate way to describe the way that Doba and some others in her ecology narrate the Holocaust. That is, they describe no less suf uh, suffering and, and carnage and loss and injustice, but they do so through a very surprising lens of conceptual and cultural continuity. So it's mass violence, um, massive injustice, mass wrong, but not catastrophe in the sense of a dark cultural revolution or a subversion of the order of things. I know that that's a surprising claim to make, but I, I think that that's something that we should respect comes from outside of our centers of, of cultural um, norms and, and what we're most familiar with. And this is a part of, of, of this era of translation. When we leave our our comfort zones, we have to be ready to accept new things. And I think that that's one of the most beautiful achievements of Holocaust testimonial projects of the 20th century was that um, they, you know, different organizations, also the Fortunov organization, went abroad and they made these surprising discoveries. They didn't just record more and more of the same. They, they have these archives with, with, with surprising inflections of of how to see the Holocaust. So my second conclusion, as I promised you, the Doris style ending, comes from uh, a response that the late Jeffrey Hartman offered when hearing my work. Um, describing what I was then writing my dissertation on, I think that our encounter was back in 2010, I told him that I wanted to explore the differences between clusters of testimony that relate to language and place. And I unfolded my basic thesis to him as I have in this lecture today about different genres of testimony, different moral and rhetorical emphases that arose in these different ecologies I was studying. And Hartman's response was quite surprising. He listened to my thoughts on testimonial difference and then corrected me. He said, no, it is not difference that you are actually studying. It's something that is the opposite of difference. And um, of course, he was right. Scholars have always known that each individual Holocaust testimony, which is accompanied by a unique individual interviewer, will produce something different. Um, what the comparison shows is actually how there are communities of truth telling how clusters of people who are bonded together through language and place build a common language of memory. Um, and they build a shared method of going into this adventure of testimony together. And contrary to some, I do not see this shared language of testimony within each ecology as in any way a downside or a sign of inauthenticity, um, quite the opposite. Without some common frameworks, 
Without those shared rhetorical and thematic moves, survivors would have never had the social support for testifying in the first place. So if we think of Shoshana Feldman and Dory Laub's work on testimony as an I-thou relationship, there's no way that people could say I and thou without some sense of community in words and in, and in norms. And, and it's almost like some of these um, shared aspects, these, these shared topo in the testimony are like rituals of inclusion and ways of signaling to one another that they have um, a somewhat safe space of memory together. So this is um, not about difference, this is about actually um, really surprising ways in which people choose to, to share their ways of remembering. So thank you very much. Before we get to the before we get to the question and answer sec, sec, part of our time together, um, I I have the privilege of drilling down on some of the things that Hannah has been discussing, and I should say straight away, I was what I was an external reader for her dissertation on which this book is based. And I thought, wow, that's a brain two feet. And then the book was um, accepted by the University Press, or rather came to me as a manuscript. And that was really a pleasure to see how it had changed from a dissertation to becoming a manuscript for publication. And again, I thought, wow. That's a brain on two feet. I think that this is just wonderful work. And so I want to use this time to learn more about it and to learn more about her thoughts on how she did her work. So the first issue that I would like to raise, not surprisingly, is gender. As we saw the two people on whom Hannah focused her lecture today, both of them are women. She also mentioned that there was a difference between the way Suzanne H. and Meyer talked about their families, that she, Suzanne H., talked about family and relations and emotional history, while he did not. So I just wonder if you would be so kind as to talk to us about the role of gender as you see it in this work. Okay, I'm looking it up because I want to. I want to um, use. So um, I think that you're right. First of all, I, I, over the years, I was really resistant to this suggestion that came from you, and looking at this, and um, it's it's always a great. It's a great pleasure to say I was wrong. I don't know how many other people in this room have gotten that privilege, but it's a really big one. Uh, and so there, th this could have been a, a, a whole dissertation book could have written, been written just about gender. And gender, not in the sense of the biological uh, I, uh, equipment of each individual uh, survivor, but rather um, gender associated means of memory, you know, some we yes, actually came up yesterday too that, you know, yes, are you, are you an agent? Are you strong? Or are you um, someone who focuses on his or her suffering and victimhood? And that's, that is gender, you're right, but it's not just for women. And I think that there is something feminine that's more available to witnesses in 
the uh, English American ecology for different reasons. And I just want to share with you one example of that from a, um, a, a, te a, te a witness named Jack Arnell, who was a Shoah Foundation witness. And I'll offer you a quote because I do want you to know there's actually stuff in the book that I didn't present today. Um, I want the audience to know that there. So, so he's he's. This is in a different chapter. This is about the victim perpetrator encounter, and he has Jack Arnell. He's describing the moment in which he was he and his family and his community were evicted from their homes and forced into the Vilna ghetto, and this is an opportunity to describe the perpetrator, and he. Uh, elects not to describe the perpetrator, but something else. And he says, quote, there were Polish and Lithuanians who would jump on people and grab their bundles. Sickly people, the content sprawled out. It is a scene that has made a very, very big impression on me. I just walk around with a big pain in my heart. So the emphasis of that moment for, for Jack Arnell is also on the emotional stakes the what the imprint that it's left on me which is you know the very it's a very freudian notion of the self that he's built out of these imprints and that's what he's interested in and it is it is effeminate in a way and he's okay with that i mean he's 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 going there and i think that that is um that type of 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 uh, effeminate memory is maybe less available in the other ecologies, but there are other things that are that are more available. So, for example, so again, if we're talking about, um, you know, um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. But again, um, you know, there are all of these different axes of comparison that one could take up. So, gender is one of them. Language and place is another. Difference over time is another one that we heard about last night. And my object in the, in the book is not to, to overpower any other, other axes of difference, but to propose this framework as an important one. And, and also the two intersect. So gender difference in the Israeli context is really difference, different than gender difference in the American context or in the Lithuanian context. In, in, the, in the Israeli context, a really important part of surviving the Holocaust is becoming strong, making a nation of strength. And that a part of that narrative is about serving in the army, you know, and, and, and that's not available to the same degree to the women who witness. So they have to come up with all of these different jerry-rigged narrative patches to make up for the fact that they can't participate in that part of the, of the narrative that they want to participate in. So gender's there and it overlays with these other differences. And, um, but I, I go back to my original assertion that I was wrong and you were right. We were both right. <laughs> so I want to, I, I would like you to, to stay on that subject of these different mm -hmm. axes. And you are, and of course, your focus is on language mm -hmm. and on space, mm -hmm. on geography. Um, I was alerted to this question of language by the scholar Robert Melson, Bob Melson, who is a child survivor of the Holocaust, went on to become a political scientist, is Professor Emeritus at Purdue, and has thought about and spoken about how he is a slightly different person when speaking his native Polish as compared with speaking English, even though his language of literacy and adulthood and love and family and culture, all of those are English. So I wonder if you could um, try to tease out the two mm -hmm. for us. So for instance, do you, can you speak about, and maybe not, um, people whose language remains the same, but geography mm -hmm. changes. Anyway, I would just love you to tease out the... Sure. So I, I won't go into too much, you know, of this, um, these kinds of individual comparisons and tracks because then I'm, you know, I'm making a, um, an Excel chart for you. But I do want to, I want to say one, one thing. So yes, um, you know, language, languages, uh, and again, I, 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 I um, 
I go back to the notion of the language, the, the conceit of an ecology and resources because I'm not talking about limitations. I don't think that, that this is about limiting what you can say, quite the opposite. I think that this is hard enough to talk about that we need resources. So the resources that come from language um, help people to say what they want to say rather than limiting who they can be. In. And, but you know, if we think about um, Mikhail Bakhtin's notion of language and that, um, that every expression is a story, it's an intertext that's been compressed into those words. Every idiom that we use has memory, um, it has references. So when we enter into that intertext of one language, we have a different set of memories, we have a different set of, of imagined audiences, and so it stands to reason that we would be somewhat different people in different languages. Regarding language in place, when I was doing my work in Lithuania, I began the project by interviewing people in Lithuania. Uh, I worked with a sociolinguist named Dovid Katz, and he taught me something very important. He said that once language has been transplanted in the long term, not you know for two weeks or something, it actually becomes a slightly different language. Um, so this is especially true of, of Yiddish in post-war America. Um, they came here, Yiddish speakers came here, met with um, a Yiddish speaking community who had already developed their dialect of Yiddish and they had better pick up on it or they wouldn't be able to speak. Um, Isaac Beshev Singer has a famous essay about Yiddish and post-war America in which he says, you know, mir seine gegangen zum Drogstore und dir noch hab ich gegessen an ice cream. And he basically shows how much American English has been incorporated into the Yiddish idiom. And it's almost a new, it's a new dialect, it's a new language. So, so um, I think, and they had a literature, they had a newspaper, every, it was very developed. And so, my finding was that those who moved immediately after the war to the U.S. and for whatever reason chose to, to testify in Yiddish years later from the U.S., they were speaking American Yiddish. It was a different web of intertext. It was a different, it was a different, it was something else than the Yiddish that stayed in Lithuania. Now, the, those who, who emigrated much later, like, you know, with the wave in the 70s or the 90s, I mean, I, there was one um, testimony in Israel that I, in Yiddish, where he had just moved to Israel like six months before he was interviewed. So there was really no difference. It's as if he was still there. He had, he had transported the language and the associations with him and hadn't jumped into this new co community and, and so forth. I know this is getting intricate, but um, basically a, a language is, is also tied to, to a place, to an oikos. An oikos is a, is a house and it's contents. And so um, once you move to a new house, the, the, the language changes. Okay.